is the COVID-19 pandemic over? The president recently said such a thing on primetime television. And why did the rest of the administration immediately jump up and say, no, no, no. Of course the pandemic is not over. We're going to talk about some of that today. What's the real deal? And is the pandemic over or is it not? So once again, I'm Dr. Ben Carson, your host for this uh, podcast. And it was actually on a 60 Minutes uh, episode recently that uh, President Biden said the pandemic is over. Nobody's wearing masks. Things are good. And uh, I think that probably gave some people some joy. But uh, there were other people who uh, I think had heartburn after that because, uh, you know, they don't want to give up the excuse for continued massive spending. And, uh, you know, not even looking at the collateral effects that all this injection of money into our economy has, which is driving inflation like crazy. You think inflation is bad now, you know, at eight or nine percent. Just wait. You know, this is this is just the beginning of the wave. And the administration seems to have no understanding of that whatsoever. And uh, it, it really is problematic. But what was really quite interesting is President Biden is supposed to be the chief. He's supposed to be the one where the buck stops. And yet, he said something, and the real people who are actually the chiefs, who are actually running the government, immediately jump in and say, this is what he actually meant to say. This is what actually is going on. Now, why is that problematic? Because our system was designed in such a way that we would elect our leader. And these people who are actually running things are not people whom we re elected. We don't actually even know who they are. We all speculate about who they are, but we don't know who these people are who are actually running things and who are actually telling President Biden what he should be saying. And that is something that should really concern all of us. Now, you know, I have not myself been particularly concerned about whether the pandemic is over or not, uh, nor has my wife, because we had COVID uh, almost two years ago now. And uh, it was significant, and it was the original strain. And, um, you know, except for wonderful medical care, I probably wouldn't be here now. But the good thing is, as a result of that, I have very strong antibodies. Uh, my wife does too. We've been tested. And uh, over the last couple of years, we've been traveling all over the place, uh, mixing with all kinds of people without a care in the world because... Uh, they can't give it to us, and we can't give it to them. So <laughs> it's just not a problem. And it always has been a real curiosity why our federal government seems not to want to recognize natural immunity. Well, I guess the reason is because if they recognize that people like myself and my wife have very good protection, then they can't insist that everybody get the vaccine. And, uh, you know, that seems to be the, the really big push. And I think the pharmaceuticals are pretty happy about that. Uh, they have never made the kind of money that they're making now. It's just billions and billions of dollars. And uh, this is not to say that I'm not grateful for Operation Warp Speed that we were able to save a lot of lives. But what you have to recognize is that we've learned a lot since the beginning. 
about this virus, about how to treat it. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we've had some policies that aren't particularly useful. The FDA, for instance, won't issue an emergency use authorization, which was needed for the virus, for the vaccine, unless you can say that there's no other viable uh, treatments. And I think you'll probably remember early on, uh, President Trump was touting the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine. And of, of course, the establishment came out and said, no, 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 that's horrible stuff. Uh, it'll cause you to have all kind of heart disease and probably kill you. Uh, it was really pretty funny because hydroxychloroquine has been used for decades as an anti-malarial and for some other purposes as well. And in, on the western coast of Africa, you know, many countries, they use it as an anti-malarial and their incidence of COVID was a tiny fraction of what ours was. So if we were really following the science, it seems like we would have perked our ears up and said, why is it that the people who live in that region of the world are getting very few cases of COVID? And we would have been investigating that and going down that trail. And uh, probably a lot of lives would have been saved. Same is true with ivermectin in Southern India, same kind of situation. And uh, I, I hope that we learn from this. We learned that it's possible to pursue more than one treatment at a time, particularly when you've got something that is killing people. And uh, I'm not sure why that isn't just common sense. Why wouldn't you say, let's go down several tracks simultaneously and let's see which thing is working most efficaciously and let's make that available to the people. But we, we certainly didn't do it this time. Let's hope that maybe we will do it the next time around. But unfortunately, we do have those people we have to deal with uh, who have the philosophy that you should never let a crisis go to waste. Always use it to the max in order to advance whatever political goals you wish to have. And so they manufacture crises and then, uh, of course, uh, we the people have to deal with the crisis that they manufacture. Most people can recognize a crisis. You know, they're equipped with significant mental faculties and they know what a crisis is and they know what a crisis does to them. But, you know, we unfortunately have a lot of people in the political class who are of the opinion that you should not really pay attention to what your eyes tell you. Don't pay attention to what your ears tell you. Don't pay attention to what your heart tells you. Just listen to them. They'll tell you what to do. They'll tell you what to think. They'll tell you what to say. And as an added bonus, if you say something different, or if you think something different, they'll cancel you or they'll make sure that you and your family have a difficult time. Does that sound like America? Does that sound like the place that our founders intended for us to live in? Or did they want us to have a bunch of people sitting there making mandates based on data that is erroneous? You be the judge. But uh, interestingly enough, the White House has been struggling to secure, to secure even more funding uh, for uh, COVID, uh, for vaccinations, uh, for testing, uh, for various types of treatment. They want $22.4 billion uh, added to the uh, short-term funding bill, the continuing resolution that has to be voted on before the end of uh, this month to avoid a government shutdown. You know, why do we need more testing? You know, they're trying to make uh, 
testing kits free, uh, certainly for everybody on Medicare, but eventually for everybody, so we can test at will anytime. Now, there's only one problem with that. Each iteration of the virus is more contagious but less virulent. So that's why you see so many people who say, oh, I tested positive, so I'm going to have to isolate for five days, even though they're not sick at all. And uh, pretty soon, just about everybody will have it. And uh, just about anybody you test might be problematic. So we're going to have to figure out how to deal with this as it becomes endemic, as it becomes a part of our society, we have got to be able to deal with it without it causing us to go through, jump through all kind of hoops and change the way that we live. We have learned how to conquer this and we can no longer let it rule our lives. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to have to be we the people, I think, who wind up dragging the government along uh, so that they uh, finally recognize that. Uh, you know, it, I was talking to someone uh, earlier today who said, uh, I've been lucky. I, I've never gotten sick and I never took vaccine either. And I informed them that they probably have antibodies. A lot of people who say that do have antibodies. They have had it. Uh, they just had uh, a mild case or they had an immune system that recognized it immediately and was able to deal with it uh, quite effectively. Well, uh, we're going to uh, be taking a, a little break in a minute here. But uh, I want, you, just before we do that, to uh, recognize that one of the reasons that they want to continue the declaration of emergency for COVID is because uh, it allows uh, many low-income Americans uh, to continue to have access to health insurance through Medicaid. And these are people who wouldn't normally qualify for Medicaid. Their income would be too high. And so that is actually uh, a humanitarian thought. But you have to recognize that that was not how our country was designed. It wasn't designed to make everybody's life easy and to take care of all their needs. It was designed to give everybody an opportunity to do those things for themselves. You know, the socialism says to people, give us all the power and we will take care of you from cradle to grave and we will take care of all your needs. And it's very seductive and a lot of people fall for it. But in the long run, very few people are happy with it, except those who are in the ruling class. So that's something to really keep in mind. You know, nearly 16 million people will lose this access to Medicaid uh, if, you know, we don't declare this an emergency. But how many people will lose portions of their freedom if we continue to make the government the god of their lives? Something for all of us to think about. And we'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. You know, we were talking about uh, how many people are getting government assistance uh, with their medical issues and getting access to Medicaid. Did you ever stop and think about 
what we're going to do with the millions of people who are coming across our southern border. And of course, if uh, we get rid of Title 42, uh, that number is going to increase dramatically because, you know, the Customs and Border uh, Protection people uh, won't be able to send people back for medical reasons. Uh, think about the implications of that. How many people can we actually take care of? And look at what's happening to our national debt every single day, just going up, up, up. And eventually, it'll be at such astronomical levels uh, that it's going to affect the quality of life of every American with the inflation going up like crazy, with the national debt going up like crazy, and no responsible people in the political atmosphere. Why wouldn't we have the same fate as all the other nations who did exactly the same thing? You know, doing things that don't make sense over and over again and expecting a different result is this definition of insanity. We're crazy if we think we can go down this pathway and not be affected by it, not have the same things happen to us that happened to Venezuela, that happened to Argentina, that happened to several European states. We have got to be smarter than that. I think we are smarter than that. But what it does mean is that we have to start acting smarter than that. We can't just sit around and complain and wring our hands and say, what's happening to our country and what's going to happen to our children? We have to be vocal about it. We have to be willing to talk about it. Uh, and sometimes there are consequences when you speak up. You might lose your job. You might get canceled in some way. Uh, you might lose some friends. But, you know, I'll tell you what. If they're going to abandon friendship with you for that reason, they weren't really your friend to start with. So what you've got to do and what we all have to do is learn to stand up for what we believe in. Do what's right. Doesn't mean that you just go headlong like a bull in a china shop. You have to be smart. You have to think about consequences. You have to think about strategies and how to do things, how to organize, how to work with other people. But the bottom line is there is a difference between right and wrong. You know, we used to teach that in our schools. Uh, in fact, in many of the schools, the Ten Commandments used to hang up. And then the political correctness police said, you can't have that in a public school. Why not? What's wrong with thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, honor your father and mother? What's wrong with that? What, what is, why are those problematic? Maybe because we don't teach things like that, maybe that's why all those things are happening and accelerating in our society. And maybe that's the reason that our society is deteriorating. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe that's why we don't understand the concept of fairness anymore. I mean, what about the student loan debt relief program? How is that fair to those people who work so hard to pay off their student loans? How is that fair to people who never went to college, but now their hard earned, hard income, hard earned income is being used to take care of the debts of those who did go to college who are going to end up frequently with cushy jobs and a nice salary, 
but you have to subsidize their education. I mean, I am all for education, believe me. Uh, you know, we have the Carson Scholars Fund. It's active in all 50 states to give honor to those students who work so hard to achieve a high academic level and who also care about others. You know, it's just as important because we're trying to develop future leaders who are not only smart, but who care about their fellow man. That's so vitally important. But there are ways to get that education that don't require you to take advantage of other people and to take resources from them that they have worked hard uh, to obtain. And this is what we're going to have to start thinking about as a nation. How do we become fairer, more just, liberty and justice for all? Not just words that should roll off of our lips, but things that we should be thinking about. And you know what else is uh, troubling me right now? Looking at our military. Do you realize that this has been the, f the worst recruiting year ever for the military? Nobody wants to get into the military. There's all this wokeism that's going on. You know, earlier this year, I was a speaker at the United States Air Force Academy. And so many of the cadets came up to me afterwards and said, oh, thank you for a non-woke speech, for just telling it like it is. And I think that's what we're going to have to, to start doing and not worrying about the consequences. Look what's happening to our National Guard. We need our National Guard. Uh, in 2023, we're going to lose at least 9,000, another 5,000 a year after that, and the numbers keep going down. It's almost like we're trying to prepare ourselves for some kind of real disaster. I'm worried about that. And, you know, as, as far as leaving our southern border open, it's not just the, the people who are coming across that we have to support. And believe me, I, I have a heart for those people. If, if I lived somewhere else, I'd want to be in here too. But there is a correct way to do it. But you know who else is coming across that border? Terrorists. People who want to destroy us. You know, after 9-11, we said we would never forget we would never allow the circumstances to occur so that we could be attacked again. We've forgotten. Anybody can come across that southern border, including those who want badly to harm us, to destroy us. Why wouldn't they send their operatives to that border and target all of our vulnerable spots? and at the prescribed moment, wreak havoc on our nation. They'd be nuts not to do that if they are our enemies and they want to destroy us. So I can guarantee you it's going on, and it's only the grace of God that is saving us right now. So please keep praying. But more importantly, exercise your civic duty to vote. Make sure you are registered to vote. And uh, if, if you go to our website, AmericanCornerstone.org, uh, there's information there to help you in that regard. But also, when you vote, know who you're voting for. Don't just vote for the name that looks familiar. Make sure you know who they are and vote your values. You know, the founders of this nation understood that eventually we might get to a place like this. But they also knew that as long as we had a well-informed and educated citizenry, that they would be able to maintain control of the government. 
we have to be that well-informed and educated citizenry. They also said, John Adams, our second president, said our Constitution was designed for a moral and religious people and is woolly and adequate for the governance of any other. And we needn't be ashamed of our faith and of our love of our fellow man and of our willingness to help our fellow man, particularly those who cannot help themselves. Now we've been talking about uh, COVID and uh, whether or not the pandemic is over or not. Uh, you know, we know that we have got to get our businesses going again. We have got to get people working again. We have millions and millions of open jobs. And we have millions of people who are at home, sitting on their hands, collecting benefits. You know, I'll tell you something about doing that. When you go and you work, even though you may be making the same as if you didn't work, you are gaining skills. You are creating relationships. You are being exposed to opportunities to climb the economic ladder. And in the long run, you will be much better off. But you're also doing your community a favor and you're doing your nation a favor when you go out and join the workforce. We also have got to start putting some pressure on some of our elected officials who don't seem to understand the consequences of bankrupting our society. Maybe they think they're gonna be okay and maybe they think their families are gonna be okay and they don't need to worry about anybody else. But if that's their attitude, we need to get them out of there. We need to put people in who actually understand that in a democratic republic, which is what we are, our representatives are supposed to represent us. They're supposed to, to do the things that are beneficial to the people who reside in their district. And when they don't do that, there's a real problem. We also need people who understand that shutting down the economy has significant ramifications. Think about what's happened to our kids at school. You know, reading scores down significantly, math scores down significantly, in fact, down more than they have been in 30 plus years. And this is especially true for students of color. And many of those who are in socioeconomically deprived areas, uh, they don't have access to high speed internet, for instance. And it makes it really, really difficult for them uh, to be successful uh, in a external learning uh, atmosphere something that we really need to start thinking about. Now, eventually, uh, those external atmospheres are probably uh, going to be something that works because one of the things where we're making a lot of progress right now is virtual reality. I remember when I was secretary, I had a virtual reality demonstration. They came in and brought the, the headset and I was in somebody's backyard uh, and they were showing me where the meter box was, how to open it, what the various buttons and wires uh, meant and how they should be handled. And it was as if you were there. And uh, as that technology improves, uh, think about what we'll be able to do in the, in the school. Instead of teaching our kids about the Peloponnesian War, they can be there. <laughs> they can witness it. Uh, instead of the Revolutionary War, 
they can be there. They can see George Washington. They can see the conditions that are that our soldiers had to overcome. And they can see just how truly miraculous it was that we became the country that we did. Some of the things that happened used to be written down in our history books because they were so incredible. And they showed us really that there was a power greater than ourselves that was involved in the establishment of this nation. And that's why the very first cornerstone that we honor at the American Cornerstone Institute is our faith. And that faith allowed a ragtag bunch of militiamen to defeat the most powerful military force on the face of the earth. Think about that. That faith allowed us to overcome the Nazis in World War II. That faith allowed us as a nation to become victorious in the civil rights struggle and to provide rights for all of our citizens. Now, I'm not saying that we as a nation are perfect, because we're not. Because we're composed of human beings, and human beings are not perfect, which is why we need a savior. But think about all the incredible things that have been overcome because of our faith. And we can never let that go. But also, you know, in terms of the consequences of shutting down our whole economy, think about the mental health issues that have affected so many of our citizens. You know, particularly our students, suicides at record levels. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of students lost important caregivers in their lives. They become depressed, and then you isolate them, and you impose various mandates. Why do you think they're going to be healthy in a situation like that? Many of them are not going to be. And we have to think about the, the consequences of what we do. You know, we had government scientists saying, isolate, isolate, and wear these masks and don't get a chance to see the facial expressions of other people and stay away from your grandmother, even though she might be dying. They don't think about the ramifications of all of these things and how they negatively impact a person's mental well-being. And unless you can really sit down and do an appropriate benefit to risk ratio analysis, you really shouldn't be making recommendations to anybody. If you can't look at the collateral damage that's being done and compare that to what damage or danger there might be from the entity that you're looking at, then you're not really someone who should have authority. If you don't recognize for children that the chances of them dying from the coronavirus or having a severe complication is 0.025%. It's not very high. That's approaching zero. And then when you look at the collateral damage of isolating those children, the depression, the anxiety, the suicide, the increased use of drugs. That's what we need to be thinking about. The, there's a new term that uh, 
has been coined by the NIH. It's called coronaphobia. You see some people wearing masks in the car while they're driving and there's no one else in the car. <laughs> I mean, talk about coronaphobia. And some of those effects are going to be long term. Some people will never get over it. You know, the other thing that has happened uh, in conjunction with uh, us neglecting our southern border, in addition to allowing anybody to come in here is nations like Venezuela have said, why should we spend so much of our resources taking care of some of the worst elements that we have imprisoned for long term or for life? Why don't we just send those people to the border and let them cross over into the United States? It's amazing that they haven't figured that out before, but that's what's starting to happen now. All of this is happening. Why aren't the so-called compassionate people concerned about those things? Those things affect all of us. We're going to be seeing the impact of all of this for many, many years to come. And I hope we can learn from it. You know, when the last time we had a pandemic uh, that killed a lot of people was in 1918 and 1919. It lasted for those two years. There were 500 million people who were infected and 50 million people around the world died. That's like 10% of all the people who were infected. Uh, with this pandemic that we've had with uh, coronavirus, 600 million people were infected. Six and a half million people died. So way less than 10%, closer to 1%. And interestingly enough, even though more people died the last time, the economic effect was much shorter. And it may be because they didn't have a bunch of politicians who were power hungry, who were trying to prolong the impact, prolong the fear. And I hope that all of us can learn something from this. And we are going to have to restore not only our economy, but we have to restore the faith of the people. Can you imagine how much credibility has been lost by the NIH and the CDC because of their inconsistency and questions about their integrity? This is really problematic, and it's going to take us a good little while to restore that faith. I suspect it could be restored a lot faster if we could see just a little bit of humility. If some of those folks could say, you know what, we were wrong, uh, and we're sorry, we're sorry for the inconvenience and the problems that it caused, uh, and here's what we've learned from doing that. And it won't happen again. Of course, you'll never hear that. But I'm saying it would make a real difference if we could hear it. And, you know, why is it that people want to mandate how we behave? They want to mandate what we have to do when we have perfectly capable medical professionals who can work with the populace who can tailor the treatments according to that individual's needs. Why do we have to have people going around mandating, you must do this, you must do that? Why did we have to lose so many people in the airline industry who didn't want to be vaccinated? And look at the 
domino effect that that had on transportation in this country. Why do we have this overreach going on? And why do people feel that they have to have this power? Why do they have to bother other people? Why can't they just live and let live? You know, that was really the intentions of the founders of this nation. They wanted a place where people could live the way they wanted to live, according to their belief systems, as long as they didn't interfere with the lives of others. What an incredible concept. And I hope that instead of prolonging this pandemic, our government can start concentrating on getting back to normal again. We know how to treat this thing. We've learned a lot about this virus. We have all kinds of therapies for it now. We don't have to allow it to ruin our lives any longer. We don't have to use it as an excuse to do things that we shouldn't be doing anyway. We can do this. This is not a Republican thing or a Democrat thing. This is a decent American way of doing things. And I hope that that's what we will continue to do. And we'll be back in one moment to answer one of your questions and with our prescription for the week. And we have a question from Cheryl from St. Paul, Minnesota. She asked, Dr. Carson, I never got the vaccine, but I'm not an anti-vaxxer. My work didn't require it, and I'm relatively young and in good health, so I opted not to get it. I've been reading a lot about the new vaccines, boosters for the latest strains, and have been trying to get a some good information so I can make an informed decision on whether to get it or not. I went to college, but I don't have a scientific background. Can you explain to me in plain English what is an mRNA vaccine anyway? And if I didn't get the original vaccine, can I just get the boosters which I hear are more targeted to the newest strains. First of all, no, you can't get the uh, boosters if you haven't had the vaccines. Uh, you know, the, the boosters have a much smaller amounts and they feel that they probably wouldn't uh, invoke the kind of immune response that is necessary and desired. Now, normal vaccines take pieces of the virus or watered down versions of the virus and inject those to create a response from the body's immune system. And uh, the mRNA vaccine is different. It actually uh, injects the uh, messenger RNA, which is taken into the cells and takes over the machinery of the cell to produce spike protein. The spike proteins are characteristic of the surface of coronaviruses. And therefore, uh, you have the manufacture of uh, antibodies that can respond to the virus itself. It's not a brand new technology. It's been used before for uh, other types of uh, disease processes and, and even has been experimented and for cancer treatment. So that's what it is uh, in simple terms. Uh, we don't know, quite frankly, uh, what the long-term impact of it is. Uh, I guess we'll be finding out as time goes on. But uh, thank you for your question, Cheryl. If, if you all have questions, uh, please send them to us. We'd like to hear from you 
uh, email me your questions, ben at americancornerstone.org. We'll try to answer some of your questions uh, on the show, but keep them short and put in the subject line, podcast. And uh, please subscribe for free for the Apple Podcast or Stitcher, or Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so that you never miss an episode. Remember to rate us and review us like you have been doing and spreading the word. We thank you for that. And uh, tell your family and friends to join us. We all want to play a role in bringing common sense back to America. And until next week, treasure the cornerstones of faith liberty, community, and life. See you next week.